especially tonight when we're supposed to get snow. But I don't know. I'm excited. I'm ready for some snow. But you may want to smack me for saying that. But <laughs> uh, as I as I was beginning to prepare for this series, I understood big picture concept. We all have aha stories. We all have those moments that God has interacted with us in our lives and changed things. But nothing was specific was coming to my mind at first. But at least not uh, what's probably the deepest trip into my distant country. But as I studied more and as I went through the material more, uh, I was faced with what's probably been my biggest aha moment. And I realized just how far away from the Father's house I actually went at one point. How far into the distant country I had truly gone. So over the next few weeks as we finish this series, I'm going to use a lot of my story as part of it. You won't have that next week because Phil Weiss will be here speaking. Uh, he will be continuing our series, so he may tell you about his distant country. I don't know. Uh, but I'm going to use my story as some of our illustrations over the next few weeks as we finish this out. Not because I want to brag about myself, but because I've learned a lot from my mistakes and I'm sure that the, uh, we can all learn from each other's mistakes in that sense. How uh, the, those mistakes led to the distant country that we're talking about today and that we can all learn how God can bring us back out of that. But just a little bit of a refresher, aha, just that idea that when your life can, collides with God's grace and there is an undeniable change. That's what we're talking about when we say aha. Our world is full of those aha stories. When God's grace enters the picture of our lives, things can't stay the same and we have an aha moment. But aha stories don't start out as great stories. In fact, most aha stories start out pretty rough. And that's because in order for there to be a need for aha in our Christian lives, we have to have left the Father's house. And we talked about that idea last week. It's not if we leave, it's when we leave, because we all do at some point. We have to have purposely told God at one point or another that we didn't want to live under His roof anymore. Sometimes that happens subtly, over time, and sometimes it's a, an abrupt, clean break. But regardless of what it's like when we leave the Father's house, that's how all aha stories begin. Mine was subtle. Mine started off when I lost my dad at the age of 15. I had to grow up very, very quickly. I was an only child, and I had to grow up and start taking care of my mom. I didn't have that normal, teenage, rebellious time when I was in high school. But then when I moved away from home and went to college, when I was five, five and a half hours from home, I realized, hey, I can finally have some fun. I can finally rebel a little bit. I can go out and do things that I shouldn't do because who's to stop me? I'm an adult now. Nobody is here to tell me otherwise. And here's the thing about leaving the Father's house. It's not usually a sad thing at first. In fact, it, let's be honest with it, leaving the Father's house at first seems pretty fun, doesn't it? Going out and doing your own thing. We looked last week at the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. We'll be studying that story again for the next few weeks. And we read the first two verses of this parable last week and we saw that the younger of the two sons demanded his inheritance early and that his father gave it to him. We're not exactly sure what made the son want to leave his father's house, but he did. So just a little bit of a refresher, chapter 15, 11, and 12, but we'll also be looking at 13 in this one. So 15, 11 through 13. He also said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the, the estate coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. So he asked for his inheritance. 
And we said last week in that culture, asking for your inheritance early is basically a slap in the face to your father saying, I wish you were dead. So keep that in mind. But he asked for his inheritance. He left his father's house and he went off to the distant country. So this is another thing that almost all aha stories have in common. The distant country. In this story, the distant country is literally just a faraway place. But figuratively, the reality of the distant country is that it's not just a random place. It's a place distant specifically from the Father's house. So in other words, we're running as far away from God as we can. All aha stories end up there. Because it's not really an aha story if you don't leave the Father's house. It starts off with a simple request to do things your own way for a little while. And then you end up in the distant country, sometimes without even realizing it. It starts off wanting to do things your way. You end up in that distant country. It starts off just wanting to blow off a little steam. And you end up in the distant country. The lady in this video clip that we're going to watch, this is part of Kyle Eidelman's small group study through this series. In this clip, she's married, uh, but she's run, ran into an old high school flame, a friend, a crush. And at this point of the story, she's already asked her husband for a divorce. And now here she is with her classmate. We were so young then. Oh, we thought we knew everything, and we found out quick. We didn't know anything. <laughs> well, we're still young. You're as young as you feel. <laughs> wow. Then I feel like a teenager right now. <laughs> I cannot remember the last time I felt this free. Are you? Free of me. Would you like to come upstairs? I thought you'd never ask. We were so young then. Here's the thing about the distant country, though. It seems really, really fun at first. You don't have to answer to anyone. You get to make the decisions. You don't have to answer to anyone, you don't have to feel guilty. You're the one on the throne. Do you see why that's wrong? You get to the distant country, you look around and you love it. But first and foremost, the distant country will leave you broke. Luke 15, 13 that we just read a moment ago says that the son squandered his wealth in wild living. We don't get any details as to what that wild living was, but you can probably fill in the missing pieces of the puzzle. I mean, the son would have probably been around the age of 18. So imagine an 18-year-old getting a pretty huge chunk of money and going off and living on their own without really a plan. I would imagine that that wealth wouldn't last very long, would it? And that's probably even if the kid had a pretty, was a pretty good kid. Well, the son doesn't exactly live on the straight and narrow path. The Greek word for foolish living in the, in the uh, Christian Standard Bible is defined as the manner of life by which someone destroys himself, or wild and undisciplined life. So his life's out of control. It started off as just going out and living on his own, chasing his own dreams, but it ended up being more than he could handle. And it cost him more than he could ever imagine. The unfortunate truth is that many of us have found ourselves in that distant country. We may not have meant to end up there, but we got there. We may not have intended to stay, but we stayed. And we may not have intended to take up permanent residence, but that's exactly what happened. And before we know it, it would be a fair description 
If someone said of us, they squandered all they had in wild living. Now, my wild living may look different than your wild living, but the fact is, most of us have fled to that distant country. Sure, it may not have been wealth that was lost, but it might have been a reputation. Or it may not have been wealth that was lost, but it might have been your family. There may not have been wealth that was lost, but it might have been the trust of someone that you love deeply. It may not have been wealth that was lost, or it might have been your job. In the distant country that seemed so fun, so free, so exciting at first, now it is a desolate wasteland. Mine, my trip to the distant country almost cost me the opportunity to study ministry. It almost got me kicked out of Bible college. Never intended for it to get there, but it did. And that's not all that it could do, though. Luke 15, 14 through 16, the story continues. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. So once the son has gone off and squandered all that he had and spent all his money that he had demanded from his father, the worst thing that could ever happen in that scenario happens. A famine strikes the land. There's no rain, there's no food, there's no money to be found anywhere. And the sun is absolutely broke. The distant country seems to be a good place to be, but it will leave you empty. It may start out as just another innocent decision or change that seems to be like no big deal. It's my life, right? They're my choices. But when we live apart from the Father... It starts to hurt. We've burned some bridges with people. We've become so much of an island that no one is around to help. Think about it this way. Once that new fling is over and you realize you're all alone. Or once you climb the corporate ladder but you realize you have no family, no friends, nothing outside of the office. Or you've stored up all the money that you thought you could ever want, but all you want is more. Or once everyone knows that all you really care about is yourself. Or you're evicted because you spent everything you had without paying your rent. Or again, you're almost kicked out of school because... Going out and having a couple of beers is more important than following an agreement that you signed saying that you wouldn't drink while you're in Bible college. And I'll be the first one to tell you I wasn't out getting drunk, but I had signed an agreement that I would not drink at all. And it almost cost me my chance to study ministry. Before you know it, your life has begun to hurt you more than you ever imagined. The distant country will always leave you broke. It doesn't matter what made you leave the Father's house in the first place. The alternative is eventually the distant country. And that distant country will take everything you had and leave you with absolutely nothing. And maybe even worse than that, the distant country will leave you all alone. It will leave you broke, but then it will leave you all alone. When the son decides to leave home, it's not just an isolated decision. His dad's involved. His older brother is involved. The story doesn't mention his mother, but we'd have to guess that she's heartbroken if she's still alive. And when we live apart from the Father, it doesn't just affect us. You know, we may leave because we want to do things our way, but that decision affects more than just us. When a man justifies having an affair because she's just not being what he needs. It affects more than just him, doesn't it? 
when a woman justifies having an affair because he just doesn't seem to care anymore. Or when you stay late at work because you want that raise and you want that promotion, but your family goes to bed every night without seeing you. Or when you become selfish with your money. These all affect people in ways that we may or may not see, but over time it starts to hurt, and before we know it, your life has begun to hurt others more than you could ever imagine. There's a TV show called Intervention. What happens in the show is somebody, somebody who's severely addicted to drugs or has an eating disorder or is consumed with alcohol, and then the show culminates in that person's closest friends and family members telling that person how they've been affected by their friend's struggle. I've never watched the show, but reading some of the stories about it, one sister said to her brother, All I wanted was to be around you, big brother. But things are different now. I've gone from always wanting to be in your presence to being fearful of being alone in a room with you. One son said to his father, Dad, if I had one wish, I would wish that you would get better. Please get better for our family. One mother said to her daughter, I hope you will always remember the good times we had, but everything changed since you got sick. You're, more, you're very disrespectful and very rude to us, and we will not take this anymore. We want our daughter back. The difficult truth is that life in the distant country doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone around us. And often choosing to live there for very long long leaves us all alone. One of the moments that I felt most alone in my life was the relationship that I had before I met Kelly, the last girl that I dated before I met her. And when she dumped me, that was probably that was that was my aha moment. That was what woke me up. That was what made me realize how far I had gone from the Father's house. I was dating a girl that I met at church, but after getting to know her, I probably should have realized that I should not have been dating her at all because she was not a good Christian woman. In fact, I was teaching in a youth group setting one night, and I was teaching on the verse that says, you should not be unequally yoked. And she spoke up and disagreed with the Bible right there in front of me, and I didn't have the courage to say anything to to argue with her for that. That was just one of the many instances that should have made me realize I was not the person I should be and I was not dating somebody that I should have been. But when she dumped me, it, it woke me up. I hit rotten bottom. But just when it seems that you're at the end of your rope, that's the thing is God has something to say. Because here's the thing, God is really good at writing aha stories. Think about them. When Saul was living in the distant country in Acts 7 and 8, God met him and told him to go home in Acts 9. When the nation of Judah was living in the distant country in 2 Chronicles 34, the book of the law was found and God reminded them He wanted them to come home. And there was a great revival in the nation. God is really good at taking a rough beginning and telling a beautiful story because it's in that moment in that distant country when it seems like the story is over that God sees a beginning and He tries to get your attention. Some of us are harder to get our attention than others. I was one of the hard ones, I admit that. When the light appeared to Saul, he was blinded. When the law was read... To Josiah and he mourned God got their attention by pointing out their story and saying this is not how this story is going to end if you let me take it from here this is only the beginning my prayer for all of us is that we let God wake us up from our sleep in the distant country that we let God show us the story that he wants to tell with the beginning that he's given us See, every story has a beginning, but no other story ends like God's does. 
And that's the thing, is we don't do aha on our own. We have to rely on God's story. I don't know how God might try to get your attention. It might be like 1 Kings 19, when God got Elijah's attention. He wasn't in the powerful wind. He wasn't in the earthquake or the fire, but he came in a whisper. Or it might be like Ephesians 5 when Paul writes, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. God might yell and wake you up even if you're not really listening. I don't know. But if we want to live the aha story that God wants to write, it's going to take leaving the distant country and going back home. And that's where aha comes in. It's going to take waking up, seeing where we are, seeing who we've hurt, and seeing who we have allowed to be king of our lives, and letting God take it from there. Now, I've, in, in planning this sermon series and planning when it was going to be, I had not looked at the invitation song. And I love when God does this. Think about what we're talking about and then think about the invitation song that we're singing today. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather ha- be His than have riches untold. That's what we're talking about, guys. Leave what we want and run to Jesus. Come back to God's house. The distant country is going to leave us broken all alone. And all we have to do is turn and say, God, I want to come home and He runs to us. Any decision you need to make this morning, now's the time to do so as we stand and sing. Again, 506, I'd rather have Jesus. We're going to sing all three.
Uh, there are quite a few announcements on the back of your bulletin. I'm not going to go through them one at a time, but just make sure you check those. Uh, do want to point out next week, Phil Weiss will be here to preach, to fill in for me. Uh, he'll also be doing Sunday school as well, uh, giving an update on Prairie View Christian Camp during that Sunday school hour. Um, he is the director of Prairie View Christian Camp, uh, so come out and support him. Uh, there is a Thanksgiving meal in Longdale today, free for the community, so anybody that wants to go to that is welcome. And also I wanted to remind you that uh, Todd Hoffman came forward last week, and uh, we announced that he is going to get baptized this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and anyone is, is welcome to come back and join us for that celebration. Uh, I know Todd and his family are extremely excited about that and would love to have anybody that can be here to, to be here for that. Uh, also, uh, Beth handed me this, the Watonga Community Theater is presenting First Baptist of I Ivy Gap. It's a, a, a play at their theater uh, beginning this Thursday and running through the 19th of November. I will put this out on the bulletin board if anybody's interested. The info is on, uh, on that. Is there anything else that I'm missing? All right, let me close with a word of prayer before we go into our last chorus. Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. And God, may we realize how you have reached into our lives and changed things when we've been living in that distant country. May you help us realize that we need to turn back and come back to your house if we're still living there now. God, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for what he did for us on the cross. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.